connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Grabiwalino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect for the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways of being in community and with each other in good relationship with indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. Today, the service is actually led by Reverend Ford and with Wells Lang, um, an associate music director. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Families with young children are always welcome in the sanctuary, and there is an additional seating in the entree foyer in the narthex, or in the narthex. Um, sorry for the phone. Let me just get a few announcements. <sighs> Whatever. Um, <laughs> Uh, just letting you know that we are still looking for Sunday ambassadors to join our uh, to join us. Ginger Fury, our membership manager, and Reverend Omega are looking for Sunday ambassadors to help make our gatherings a success by fulfilling welcoming and ushering duties and connecting visitors and members to resources in our community. If you'd like to know more, please reach out to Ginger. And also letting you know that Chalice Circles um, our sign ups are going on right now. Um, there are groups of eight to 10 neighborhood members and friends to meet monthly to discuss such topics as, okay, I, there's a word I can't read, and courageous and, <laughs> there's glare, I'm sorry, and wonder. Uh, circle members are encouraged to speak from their hearts. And that's what I was just doing right now, was speaking from my heart. <laughs> Uh, as well as from their minds. Sharing leads to deeper conversations that uh, what can be held, um, deeper conversations than what can be held um, out on the patio after services and often, um, often to close connections among participants. In the coming year, we will be uh, uh, offering circles to meet by Zoom, in person, at church, and in person at participants' home. Anyway, sign-ups will begin on August 15th, and I'm sure there will be somebody better explaining this to you next time. So more extensive, and make sure you're looking at our order of service. Um, they're available on the link or in the Sunday email. Our order of service is also visible online by scanning the QR code on the back of your hymnal with your phone camera. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
Hello, everybody. Um, if you're a visitor or you've know, seen me around a little bit recently, I'm James Ford, and with Jan uh, among the newer members of our church here, the community. Uh, and I uh, have been invited into uh, uh, by, by uh, Reverend Omega as an affiliated minister with you all, mainly just acknowledging that I'm an old fart minister uh, <laughs> and she might have a use for me once in a while, like maybe preaching on the low Sunday before we launched the formal church here. Uh, uh, I mentioned to her, I have a brand new book coming out. And she said, oh, well, great, you can read out of it. Uh, you can even use this as your book launch. So welcome to my book launch. <laughs> uh, um, there'll be a little setup out there in Ginger and I'll be, G Ginger will, will handle the money and I will sign the books. It is a mini fundraiser for the church. Uh, so it's a $20 donation for the copies. Um, all the profits, which is about half of it, um, go straight to the general fund. Uh, I think that's enough advertising for the moment. Uh, I should say, uh, um, in the middle of the week, I came down with laryngitis. I've had three COVID tests, so not to, not to worry in that regard, but uh, I'm looking for my halls. Your mask or your halls? I have one. Oh, oh no, I, I've got the, the, the family pack, <laughs> just in case. We'll see how it goes. With all, with all of that, oh my, what a week. It was just about this time last Sunday, the president announced he would not be seeking re-election. Does that really feel like a week ago? Uh, I remember my first thought, wow. And my second thought, all of a sudden, there's only one old man running. So much, so much is going on. I've learned the term brat, and then there are coconut trees. And among so many of my friends, something strange is going on. I think it's called hope. That said, a pause across the continent and really around the world in our various time zones at roughly this hour on a Sunday in our thousand and more communities of hope and dream, we gather. As Reverend Omega once noted about a Sunday morning and our gathering, we are in a special moment, one in which we can pause, looking back to see how we have fared in these times of crisis often. We can pause looking forward, knowing now that we are in this for the long haul. We see the devastation. There is always devastation, hurt, loss, and longing. But also the unity and beauty of coming together in a common collective movement, making real change for ourselves, our communities, and this world. It is a subtle thing, this gathering together, this hour symbolic of so many things. We are in the womb of the world. New wonders await, new birthing is happening. This time we set aside, this hour is ours. To notice, to allow ourselves to notice. Connections tendrils of affection and care winding around our hearts and connecting us to each other and to this world. As Omega says, let us appreciate the ways in which we may hold on to that spirit of beautiful and powerful change. Beautiful and powerful change. I am in awe of the power of this moment the power of the pause, of the inward turn, how things can turn, how in that the old becomes new. We need the moment, as Omega says, this special moment, this hour. 
this time where we gather as we are, as we, who we are, this moment where we can experience what has been, this moment where we can contemplate what will be. In this moment, a pause, a breath, a letting of what is to be to settle, to let our hearts rest, to be together, to share in music and song and reflection, maybe laugh, possibly cry, but to be present to each other and to our own hearts, to experience our being together in this collective moment of change, to appreciate that spirit of beautiful and powerful change. So, come, come, let us worship together. Him one in the gray book or up on your uh, <laughs> may nothing evil cross the sky. Every Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a 501c3 organizations or neighborhood church-based social justice activities that are making a difference in our community and in the world. Each selected guest organization aligns with our community's mission and values and is nominated by church members who are longtime volunteers and supporters of these change-making organizations. You can donate in one of two ways. You can use your cell phone to donate by texting the number on the screen. I'm supposed to point and it's gonna happen. It'll happen there. Or if you'd prefer to donate in person, put your donation in one of the three designated boxes during the music or after service. Um, there are boxes in different places. I don't know if the script is accurate, but I know there's one back there. Um, please help extend help to those in the neighborhood uh, who in your neighborhood who may need assistance reaching the donation box 
If you wish to make a payment toward your pledge or contr contrib contribute to church operations, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation boxes. This week, our gifts will support Outward Bound Adventures. Here to tell us more is Mr. Charles Thomas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, this is a new concept, right? Sunday morning church, all right. <laughs> Corinne, you happy? You got me back. <laughs> um, I'm here to bring y'all a spot of tea, a spot of tea standing for a transformational experiential education. Outward Bound Adventures, as you can see up here, is about getting those with an inherited disadvantage out connected to nature. We just had a crew come in from 17 days in the Tahoe National Forest. We had a crew just leave out for 16 days on the uh, Redwoods, on the Humboldt. Some of them are working, some of them are just uh, being out there connecting to nature. But always our organization is about getting young folks who traditionally haven't had a chance to get out get out and get connected to nature with the hopes that will steer them towards a career in conservation. The same thing happened to me many, many years ago when I was a young kid and I wound up becoming the executive director of the organization. So I just want to say thank you for uh, inviting me back because I, I said I'm a former member of the church and Corinne's been trying to get me back here for I don't know how long, but she did. <laughs> she did it. Okay, I'm back. Um, also, I'm going to add some clarity. Uh, last week I was here and I was talking about we being the oldest organization in the United States. Um, and we are not the oldest uh, nonprofit organization in the United States, but we are the oldest nonprofit in the United States dedicated to getting underserved urban populations, especially urban populations of color connected to nature. We've been doing it well over 65 years, and we're going to keep doing it with the help of the community and the support of the community. And I said one of the best kept secrets about Pasadena is that we're located right here, four minutes from this church. So your support is deeply appreciated. And uh, like I said, I'm kind of feeling this concept of church on Sunday. I might be back. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome back. Um, I will say, personally and professionally, you serve some of the students that are in, in my school district where I'm the administrator, so thank you. Um, you're, you're, please give, give generously. Thank you.
if you've ever uh, done a book, you know that you want to be careful about uh, um, pulling poetry from the uh, uh, from the world uh, because they make you pay for it. Uh, um, uh, I uh, I decided in my for this that nonetheless I had to have one poem for sure, and and so. It happens that I know the, the, the poet, uh, Lynn Unger, who's a Unitarian Universalist minister, and, and I wrote to her and I said, you know, I've got the new book coming out and I really want to use this poem. How much? And she said, two pounds of really good chocolate. <laughs> so uh, she uh, posted on social media uh, herself stuffing herself with C's uh, 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 candy and we get the reading for today. By what are you saved and how? Saved like a bit of string tucked away in a drawer? Saved like a child rushed from a burning building already singed and coughing smoke? Or are you salvaged like a car part, the one good door when the rest is wrecked? Do you believe me when I say you are neither salvaged nor saved, but salved, anointed by gentle hands where you are most tender. Haven't you seen the way snow curls down like a fresh sheet, how it covers everything, makes everything beautiful without exception? like to make a slight correction. It's called Song to the Moon, and it's from the opera Ruzalka by Antonin Dvorak. I'll say one further thing. She's beguiling the moon to bring her beloved to her.
When um, I wrote this book, it's my sixth, actually. Uh, it, it is the product of, I believe, demographically, I'm now middle old. <laughs> and so it's an attempt to respond out of my life, my practices as a Unitarian Universalist and as a Zen Buddhist. And it, it, uh, it was a, an effort of love, and I've been told it's actually relatively good. At least my relatives say that. <laughs> Let's see. I may have to call Jan up in a minute. Um, when, when I wrote it, you know, so it's 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 a it's a nonfiction uh, piece mostly, and and I uh, tried to figure out how to draw it together, and and actually what what came to me was a uh, uh, for the concluding chapter was was a story. It had uh, I had first run across it in a, a little volume called Journeys on the Razor's Edge, by somebody named Simon's Roof. Um, never wrote anything else. Uh, I found a few things that might have been about him, um, but I was never, never really quite sure. Uh, but the, what, what he did was he had spent some time in India in the first half of the 20th century, and this book came out in, I think, 1957 or so. And uh, um, it was mostly stories that he had, he had gathered. And this was a traditional Hindu story. And the... Uh, um, um, Jan was just telling me she was just reading a, a, an Indian novelist where there was the plot. Uh, 
Uh, so it's something, it has a current, it has a life. And for me, it kind of summarized this whole project of the whatever, however many pages there is in the book. So if you want to save yourself 20 bucks, yeah. here's the, the gist of, of it all. There's an old saying about politics. You run for office with poetry, but you must govern with prose. As the spiritual way opens for us, we discover our lives must incorporate both prose and poetry. There are the ordinary tasks of life, work, relationships, romantic partnerships, or marriage, sometimes children. There is the ticking of the clock. It certainly feels like prose. But as we open our eyes and hearts, we discover something. Actually, it's all poetry. Even the proof of our lives is poetry. In fact, it turns out the universe is writing stories and songs, actually whole symphonies. And there we are, you and me. We, in fact, live and breathe and take our being in stories. Like the turtles in that old joke, it's stories all the way down. And so, to recap the song and prose and poetry, to bring it all together. Once upon a time, long ago, and far away, there was a burglar. She was quick-witted and nimble-footed, so she was successful in her chosen trade. However, as sometimes happened when one is good at something, she kept pushing the envelope. And with that came the disaster. She was discovered trying to break into a rich merchant's home. She fled without anyone catching a glimpse of her face. However, as a great cry of thief rang out, pretty much the whole village was soon in hot pursuit. Fortunately for her, she was just far enough ahead of the crowd that when she saw a cave opening between the road and a creek, she had time to throw herself into the water, roll in the mud, and then climb back up to the cave. There she sat settling into a traditional meditation posture in front of the cave opening. It looked exactly as if she were simply one of the many mendicants, monastics, mad people, or others who took to the road on the great spiritual quest. When the crowd arrived in front of the cave and the convincing looking monastic their leader saw her and said, Oh, holy one, did you see the thief we were chasing? The burglar simply ignored the question and continued sitting as if she were meditating. One of the villagers said to their leader, Can't you see she's meditating? We would earn some very bad karma if we disturb her. And then another said, Let's wait. When she's ready, she'll speak. There was muttering of agreement, and the leader understood one leads by ordering people to do what they want to. So they all sat on the ground in front of the thief and waited. While the burglar sat there pretending to meditate, she desperately wondered when they would move on. Instead, more and more villagers gathered. Some remained standing, most sat down, a few even began to meditate themselves. She had this terrible feeling, if, as if she were trapped in the bottom of a dry well. After about two hours, vastly longer, longer than the burglar ever thought she could hold still, she pretended to awaken from her meditative trance. Slowly opening her eyes, she looked out at what was now about 50 people, all of them quietly waiting. 
She cleared her throat and spoke softly, but with enough volume to be heard by everyone there. Why are you looking for some poor thief, dear ones? Wouldn't it be vastly better to search for your true nature? After all, who isn't stealing their lives by ignoring the great questions of life and death? With this, the villagers were overcome, some with grief at their wasted lives, others at the call to something more important than perhaps they'd ever considered before. A few ran back to the village to gather flowers to give her. Others went home and got some food as an offering, including rare treats. Presented with the flowers and food, the burglar ate, trying not to gobble or look greedy, then asking herself, what would a wise person do in a similar situation? She asked that the majority of the food be distributed among those present, specifically that the poorest get enough and particularly some of the best delicacies. She also handed out the flowers to everyone. People felt graced. Finally, the rich merchant himself stepped forward and implored the wise nun that she remain here and grace their village with her wisdom. The burglar thought to herself, well, I'm good at my trade as a thief. It is hard work and it is too dangerous. This holy nun gig <laughs> could be an easy way to make a living. As a thief, she thought she could easily steal what she needed just by pretending to be holy. So she said, I will stay with you, but only for a brief time. The villagers were ecstatic. They brought her blankets and candles, and someone even thought to bring her a down-filled pillow. Life was comfortable beyond what she had ever experienced. The price was that she had to pretend to meditate for hours every day, and then in the early evening to answer questions the villagers would bring her. Answering questions turned out not to be difficult. It seemed she knew what a good and generous heart would do, or as she thought of it, what a sucker might do. Not a lot of difference, she was pretty sure. Pretending to meditate, however, was harder. She knew people were watching, so she really had to hold still. Life paraded on by the road. Merchants, monastics, families, and children. Once an ox led by a boy with a rope held in a loop through its nose trotted by. The pair paused and looked at her, their eyes boy and ox were dark pools, then moved on without saying anything. Time passed. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months. The food was good, the blankets were warm, and oh my, that pillow. But the burglar's meditating continued to be a terrible ordeal. She experimented with her posture, trying to find a position that wasn't painful. She began to sit on that pillow and gradually become comfortable sitting cross-legged. Over time, her knees began to drop and then touch the ground. But then there was her mind. She fantasized about everything that had happened in her life, how uh, she was raised, the poverty, the violence, the gift of learning to read at the local temple, and the reading of books. There weren't many, but she read them over and over. Then there was her trade, figuring out how to steal without getting caught, experiencing what happened early on when she was caught. The moments of joy and the long times of boredom and the intermittent flashes of terror. She also fantasized about the future about what new treats the villagers might bring, about what she would do when she tired of this and returned to the road and a life of burglary. But 
As she passed in her imagination from the past to the future, increasingly she noticed something else. At first, it was like a flash of silence, just for a moment. Gradually, it grew larger in her consciousness. After a while, as those weeks passed into those months, that space, that quiet, that just being present became a large part of her holding still, pretending to meditate. Something was now different. She began seeing the villagers in a new light. And even the words that came out of her mouth now landed in her own ears in new ways. She gradually came to know the villagers, their sorrows, how they could be so petty and even sometimes cruel. The various intrigues in their lives, their loves as they arose and sometimes fell apart, other times deepened their many generosities, sometimes unconscious, sometimes grand, and even costly. Gradually, she began to love them. And increasingly self-aware, she began to see how her own life was just like theirs. She knew they were different people, and yet somehow, mysteriously, they were also one. Increasingly, as she spoke, everything she shared was based in that mystery, that they were different and that they were more closely connected than the most finely woven fabric. Then a teenager appeared. He approached her one evening, made bows, and said he had been wandering looking for a teacher. And he had began and he had begun to hear of this amazing nun who spoke wisely and, more importantly, modeled the great gift of silent meditation. He declared he wanted to learn her wisdom. Not knowing what to do, she simply ignored him. He took a place in the dirt below her as she began to pretend to meditate. He sat quietly. The next day, she told him to go. She wasn't interested in having disciples but he continued to sit with her at a respectful distance. She knew she had to pretend to be generous, so she made sure he was fed, and before long the villagers made sure he had blankets and even a pillow of his own. He seemed much less interested in them than she was. What he seemed to love was to sit quietly. She asked him, what are you doing while meditating? She said he did what he was taught when he first decided to walk the spiritual path. He counted his breath, putting a one on his inhalation, then exhaled, then a two on his next inhalation, and continued to 10, after which he repeated the process. She said nothing. Then she tried it for herself and discovered it helped with her concentration, but it also tended to obscure that quiet place that seemed increasingly interesting to her. So, a few days later, she told him that he might try just sitting quietly, not trying to think, not trying not to think. And he did. She began to wonder, is it time to escape? The problem was that there were villagers around pretty much all the time, and the boy, well, he was there all the time. So the burglar was stuck. Over time, the burglar, the burglar grew quieter. She witnessed the day as it began. She witnessed the day as it passed. She witnessed the evening as it arose. Her last moment before sleep was noticing, witnessing, being present. And her words almost always came from that place the place where she saw she and they were all the same. Increasingly, she talked about the silence, about what she found and what they might find. One day, the boy came to her and said that when he took a walk down by the creek, a crow called out. And in that moment, he realized the crow, the creek, the trees, 
he himself and all things were joined so closely that the right word for what was true and present was simply what? He then added, embarrassed, how he knew even that one seemed a bit too much. See, what, she wasn't sure what to say, so she simply smiled at him, put her hands together, and made a small bow. They continued together in this way as the months turned into years. She wasn't sure when it happened for herself. In fact, she never had that big thing like her disciple. What she did have was a gradual growing into peace and joy and gratitude for it all. In that parade of humanity, at some point or another, another ox trotted by, this time without an attendant. It ignored her and just continued on its way. The image of its swishing tail as it trotted down the road stuck in her heart. Eventually, her fame as a wise counselor and teacher of the ways of the heart spread across the country. She was attended to faithfully by her disciple, who was increasingly seen as a wise teacher himself. A small community of monks and nuns gathered around her, and within the village, others seemed to become wise as well. One year, she fell ill, but that seemed okay. Her disciples tended to her, and that was okay. The villagers came to ask her last questions, and that was okay. The world, as terrible as it was, was also something wonderful, something amazing. And when she died, her senior disciple, now a wise and respected counselor, oversaw the burning of her corpse. He installed her ashes under some rocks out beyond the small monastery of nuns and monks that had grown over the years. The community elected him to succeed their founding teacher. Always before he lectured on the mysteries of the way, he would thank the good gods that he had been given such a wonderful guide on the mysteries of life and death. The teacher who stole his delusions. And in doing so, opened his heart. Mystery piled upon mystery. The intimate way. For the beauty of the earth, hymn 21. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing the closing hymn number 21 for the beauty of the earth.
the hour winds to a close. We have things to do. I'm going to be selling books. All of us scatter to the winds. We have work to do. We take this moment that we gather together, our opportunity to reflect and be present and be quiet. And from there, naturally, as breath inhales and exhales, we go out to work. There is much hurt in this world. There is much pain. Let us be healing agents. Let us be transformative agents. Let us be inspired by the spirit of love to act. With that, may we depart in peace and with maybe just a hint of unrest. <laughs>